Today I'm going to walk you through the different types of Meniere's disease that probably no one told you about, but that you really ought to know about if you're going to find out uh, the best treatment and get the best success with your Meniere's disease. Now, we're going to talk about it in terms of you know, like types of symptoms, how often these symptoms happen, and then lastly, we're talking about causes of the symptoms. Now, to be honest with you, that's a lot of information. I don't think I'm going to put all that in this one video. So, if you're interested in what we see here today, you know, if you put a like down, uh, then I'll make sure that I make the rest of the video. So, let's just start with Meniere's disease kind of as a definition. So, it's a diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis, meaning there aren't a certain set of lab tests. There's not a blood test for it. And it's basically defined by at least two attacks of rotatory vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss with other diseases excluded, okay? Now, with that as our umbrella, there are subtypes. And the first big branch of subtypes is what we call endolymphatic hydrops and cochlear hydrops. Okay, now, endolymphatic hydrops is the more common kind. Uh, it is the one in where you have tinnitus, you have hearing loss, and you have episodes of rotational vertigo, right? So actually feeling like you're spinning or the room is spinning. Now, cochlear high drops is a little less common, and it is characterized by tinnitus, right, noise in the ears, hearing loss, and auditory dysfunction. You don't really get the spinning in cochlear high drops. Now, as I'll talk about later, the process is essentially the same that I think that causes that and what the research typically shows. It just kind of manifests a little bit differently, right? So that's our first big type. We've got endolymphatic high drops versus cochlear high drops. Now, the next thing we have to do, though, is we have to define two terms. So I mentioned the word vertigo, right? But then there's also this thing that comes up in Meniere's patients. It's called dizziness. Now, vertigo basically is an illusion of rotation. Like, you're not actually rotating. The room's not actually rotating, but it sure as heck feels like it. Um, now, dizziness is really not rotational. Dizziness is non-spinning, right? So I'll give you some examples of that. There's a condition called mal de debarkment syndrome, or MDDS, and that's where you feel like you're rocking or swaying like you're on a boat, uh, but that's not rotational, right? There's another type of dizziness that is a little more recent diagnosis called persistent postural perceptual dizziness, or 4PD. And basically, that's when you have one or more symptoms of dizziness, unsteadiness, non-spinning vertigo that are present, you know, for most days, at least three months or more. They're exacerbated by being upright in gravity, right? Uh, being actively or passively moved, uh, and exposure to moving visual stimuli. So a lot of people uh, that have this, for example, if they go into like a big store like Walmart or something, right? And there's a lot of visual stimulation. It makes them feel gross, makes them feel unsteady. They don't necessarily spin, but they feel bad and unsteady, right? Or they are very, what I call, visually motion sensitive. For example, if something moves in front of them, their brain can't tell if it's them moving or the thing moving. And that conflict produces symptoms, right? So dizziness is not rotational. Vertigo is rotational. Okay, now, now that we've kind of got that sort of, you know, framework, right? We have Meniere's disease, endolymphatic high drops, cochlear high drops. We've defined vertigo and dizziness. Now we need to talk about the types of Meniere's that we can uh, break it down into based on the frequency of symptoms. So let's just start with type 1. So type 1 Meniere's disease really have no vertigo or dizziness for the last two years. Now notice, I didn't say no hearing loss and no tinnitus, but it is possible to have Meniere's disease and have no vertigo episodes or dizziness, right, uh, for the last two years. And that's a really good thing. That's someone whose Meniere's disease is probably pretty stable. That's someone whose balance stability pyramid has compensated and recalibrated based on their Meniere's disease. Now, if you don't know about the balance, to, balance stability pyramid, I'll link to some videos I made on that. But that's a way of thinking about your balance and stability and the different players in that, right? The vision, the vestibular system, uh, the joints and muscles in the neck and the cerebellum. So if you're type 1, you don't really have any symptoms for the last two years in terms of vertigo and dizziness, that's really good. Now, type 2 is a little bit different. Type 2 is when you have episodes of vertigo, but you don't have that chronic or constant dizziness I was talking about, right? So you're having vertigo episodes, still having tinnitus, still having hearing loss, but you're not having that co chronic constant instability and uneasiness uh, in between the episodes, right? Now, type 3 is where you have both episodes of vertigo and you have 
constant dizziness, right? So you're not only having the rotational episodes, right? They can be so bad you have, to, you have uh, nausea and you vomit, right? But now you're having in between that, your system is not recalibrating, right? Your system is not compensating correctly. There's something going on in that balance stability pyramid, and now you're having the constant dizziness. Now the last type, which is type four, is where you have the constant dizziness stuff, the non-spinning symptoms only, no episodes of vertigo. Now, again, there's a lot of stuff I want to tell you about each one of these different types, but I don't have time to talk all about it today. So the individual causes of these things are largely the same. I'll just tell you, for me, it usually ends up being the immune system, except, except when you get into type three and four, and people are having those episodes between, between the rotational episodes, they're having those symptoms of dizziness, right? That instability, that uneasiness, that kind of are visually motion sensitive. That is definitely a problem with that balance stability pyramid. And sometimes that chronic dizziness thing is not really a metabolic issue anymore. I'll talk about that some of the time. I have some cases I'll post on YouTube where we have to treat some people that have those. But now we need to talk lastly in this video about the different causes for these different types. And again, I have some other videos I'm going to go in, in depth on each one of these, but let's just talk about metabolic factors at large, right? So when we're talking about types of Meniere's disease, we can have a metabolic type of Meniere's, right? Well, what's under that? Well, metabolic are like biochemical factors such as immunophenotypes, right? You guys have heard me talk about immunophenotypes. And under that, we've got autoimmune phenotype, allergic phenotype, autoinflammatory phenotype, and then immune deficiency. That's all the immune system stuff. And then we over here, we have not metabolic factors, we have circuit factors. Now that is where I was talking about that balance stability pyramid. Um, circuit factors are kind of hard to describe in these videos because it requires a lot of you know anatomical knowledge and neuroscience, but basically what we're talking about with circuit factors is there's something going on somewhere in that pyramid. It could be the central vestibular processing pathways in the brainstem, it could be the cerebellum, uh, it could be the basal ganglia but we're not really talking about biochemical issues there. Now, there's another cause type, which is the person with Meniere's has got both metabolic and a circuit problem, okay? Now, that's just a combo, and usually we always work with the metabolic stuff first. And let me just stop here by saying that I hope you're working with someone with your Meniere's disease that understands these different types, because what happens a lot is Meniere's patients kind of get a real cookie cutter treatment plan, right? You go in, you have the Meniere symptoms, maybe they do a VNG, and then they say, well, low sodium diet and diuretics, and maybe we'll do some steroids. But if that doesn't work and like work permanently, then what do you do? Well, then you're probably in one of these type two, type three, or type four Meniere's disease. And I hope you're working with someone that has something beyond the diuretics and the low sodium diet and the steroids, because they're probably gonna need to know that if you're already in type two, three, and four, because that means your Meniere's is unstable. The last kind of cause type of Meniere's disease is you have structural damage in your inner ear that is unfortunately beyond the point of recovery. And these are people that end up getting surgery like endolymphatic decompression surgery, uh, canal plugging, and there is a place for those more extreme treatments, uh, but it's not the rule, right? So those are the different types of Meniere's disease I bet no one's ever told you about. And you have to ask yourself, why hasn't anyone ever told you? Well, it could be because you know they don't know. It's not that they don't care, but you have to know that there's a lot of information out there in the research literature about Meniere's that just no one's using. So the types that we talked about today, the reason it's important to know about them is to know where do you fit in with those, right? Because that's gonna tell us a lot about the most appropriate treatment, the best odds of helping you be stable and be symptom free as far as we can get. That might mean decreased tinnitus. Sometimes we do get hearing back. Uh, that means not having vertigo episodes. So you gotta know where do you fit in? Am I endolymphatic? Am I cochlear? Under endolymphatic, am I type one, type two, type three, type four? Because when you get into type three and four, now we're definitely getting into circuit problems, right? And medications like diuretics uh, are not really gonna do anything for that. That requires a special type of rehabilitation. And then if we're talking about the metabolic type causes, do you know what your immunophenotype is? Do you know if you have any of these metabolic factors? Those are really important things. I think it's important for you to know. I think it's important for your doctor you're working with to know. So I hope you're working with someone that understands that stuff, right? So again, if you guys found these, this, this video uh, at least partially helpful, uh, put a like on there and then I'll, if I get like 100, I'll go ahead and finish the series out and dive into each one of those topics in detail. So I hope you guys found this helpful and I'll see you next time.